I want you to turn to Joshua this morning because we're going to open up today. Start to tell you about a place called Gilgal. Okay. I love it. You know why? For the last almost two months, we've been traveling through a wilderness, figuring out our nomadic natures and our inability to plant and root, right? And God allowing us and showing us how to come up and out of that and into a promise. And so we've been journeying together. Does it feel like a journey to you? Yeah. It has to me. I love it. Oh, by the way, tithing offerings are in the back online. I'm really poor at that, and I get in trouble for that all the time. Amen? <laughs> Want to be faithful? Give that way. Do you see the massive amount of concrete tanks sitting out here? Yeah. Uh, do you know what we have is actually the little small one out there is what we have now on the ground? So that's almost seven times what... We have now going in the ground next week, amen? That's amazing. Listen, in the last 12 months, we've gone from an upper room pawn shop, right, to a permanent residence in the city. Right. Boom. That's amazing. A place you could call home. That's a prophetic gesture out there. That's an infrastructure in the timing in which we're in. We're in the time of the infrastructure. We're laying the infrastructure for what's to come. God sent our family here, right? Not to plant a church, but to raise a people. And I believe those people are going to learn what it means to be seated at the king's table. We're not, we didn't come, right? You didn't come to Remnant Church. You came to a movement. You came to a people that's learning to be on the move, who are called to this city to infiltrate, overtake, right? And let the kingdom rise in this place. Mark my words, I'll record it for you today. You can listen back to it five years from now. You are a seed, and you are being planted in this city. And God's going to use you as a refuge. Amen? Amen? Yep. I want to tell you about Gilgal this morning really bad, but I want to start in Psalm 23. Can we do that? Yes. Everybody's favorite psalm. <laughs> psalm 23 is a beautiful place to start. You know why? Because it was a... King David, who started off as a shepherd and became a king, and in his life he came to a place of rest. I'm going to talk about that today. Can we do that? Psalm 23, 1. Say there when you're there. Yeah. And when we say there when we're in our Bible, I want to let you know, in on a little secret, it's not just like I'm there on, on the actual chapter. I'm in that place where I'm going to camp for a minute, and I'm going to let the Word of God feed me. Yeah. It's like sitting at a table, maybe a dinner table, and you pull up a chair and you're like, all right, it's time to eat. Come on. Well, what got you there? The presence of God got you there. He invited you, seated you at his table, and said, hey, it's time to dine with the king, amen? Come on. I want to walk you through a little journey. Can I do that this morning? Listen, I'm a preacher by nature, so I often throw fire at you left and right. But today, I'm going to walk with you a little bit. I'm going to give you an overview and walk you through something broad that we will spend the next season on picking apart. So when I throw a lot at you today, listen, don't get worried. I want you to sit down and listen to the story. Can we do that? Would you listen to the journey that God has us on? Psalm 23, 1. Adonai is my shepherd. I like nothing. That's a statement right there. I guess we can camp. Verse 2. He has made me lie down in green pastures. He led me by quiet water. He restores my inner person. He guides me in right paths. Watch this. For his name's sake. Even if I pass through the dark, death dark ravens or the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no disaster for he is with me. Your rod and your staff, it reassures me. You prepare a table for me. Even as my enemies watch, and I love this version, you anoint my head with oil from an overflowing cup. <laughs> Verse 6, goodness and grace will pursue me every day of my life, and I will live in the house of Adonai for years and years to come. Wow. Since we've traveled through Deuteronomy, from a wilderness to a promise, that's where we have come from, both Literally through the last couple months and also spiritually for most of you in this room. King Jesus declares that you have crossed over. 
that you're no longer in a wilderness, but brought you to something called a promise. In Joshua 1 through 3, right, they crossed over from potential to promise. We saw in 2 Samuel 9, right, that we were like a crippled, securely seated son that was seated at the king's table. His name was called Mephibosheth. The king sought him out to come and place him because he simply wanted to show covenant love to him. You know that word table in the entire Hebrew Bible? It's shofan, and it means a private, sacred king's table. Not just like a common man's table, but a king's table. Anytime the table is spoken of in your Bible, it is a king's table. It says, today I want to continue seating you in sonship in order that you might rightly understand who you are. This city has an identification problem, but we're going to cure that. Yeah. Saints for Joshua and all of Israel, they were the wild child, weren't they? Anybody in here a wild child? Any of you still a wild adult? <laughs> they literally were the wild child. They grew up in the wilderness, but they were about to experience even something that their parents could not have taught them. To be seated. <coughs> to be rooted. To be home. How many of you want to be known? Yeah. Many of you want to be heard. How many of you are still looking to belong? Yeah. Yeah, God's going to bring you a place called Gilgal. Psalm 23 is written by a shepherd that was transformed into a king. Do we understand that? Yeah. Right? To a sheep who had become royalty. David knew the heart of the sheep. And he knew what it, caught, what it took to have them or make them lie down. Does it take a little bit to get you to lie down, right? Yeah, it does. He was also keen on the similarities between the sheep that he raised and the people of his kingdom. So Psalm 23 obviously has got our attention. I love it. There's a man named Philip Keller in a book called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. Listen to what he says. He says, he writes that sheep do not lie down easily and will not unless four conditions are met. Are you ready? Because they are timid, they will not lie down when they are afraid. Because they are social animals, they will not lie down if there is friction among the sheep. If, they, if flies and parasites trouble them, they will not lie down. Fourth, finally, if a sheep are anxious about food and hunger, they won't lie down. For being hungry, they won't lie down. You see, rest comes because the shepherd has dealt with fear. The shepherd has done with friction. He's dealt with flies, and he's dealt with your family. That's good. Yeah. And this is where Gilgal is going to bring us. Psalm 23, 5, you prepare a table for me, even as my enemies watch. I love that translation. You rolled it out. And they're going to watch what you're capable and able to do. <laughs> and my king's going to laugh at them. You anoint my head with oil from an overflowing cup. <laughs> Saints, I, I want to talk to you today about a table in a promised land called Gilgal. That's not a city. I want you to understand that. It's not a city. It's a place. It's like a Gilgal state of mind. You ever been there? Jen and I went to Margaritaville. I'm like, that was a real place, not just in a song. <laughs> and I get it. I know why they wrote the song. That's right, why David wrote his songs. He found a place where it was a state of mind, and God was bringing them to a place that was just like that. A place in the promise where a new breed, say new breed, a new breed of people learned to return, to refresh, to revive, and to reallocate God's inheritance. This is where he's bringing you in your journey, saints. Saints, every single time it is spoken of in the Bible except once, it is called the Gilgal, not Gilgal. You know what Gilgal means? Where the reproach was rolled away. Where the reproach was rolled away. You know what reproach means? It means disappointment, disapproval. Let me ask you something. Internally, is there still something leveraged against you? Today we're going to see the very first thing God did for his people when they crossed over 
was to bring them to a place where he would securely seat them in their sonship, a place they called home, a place or a table in which they could eat from and grow in the understanding of the invitation that they just received. Hmm. Have you ever been in one of those restaurants with one of those seven course meals that cost you absolutely too much? Yes. Yeah, somebody said, uh uh. Well, I have been there and left differently than when I showed up with a different perspective, at least. Saints, we're going to roll out a seven course meal today. Can we do that? And I got to tell you, it costs far more than any of those meals you've paid for. Come on, let's cross over, right, and see what God served up today. I want you to turn to Deuteronomy 11 and the first time that Gilgal is mentioned. I'm going to lay out seven times that Gilgal is mentioned first in the Bible. Listen, when something is spoken of first in the Bible, right, it, it comes with double importance, right? It begins a thing. And we should learn to recognize that and understand what God wants to tell us from that. Can I actually, like, give you the word this morning? Yeah. How many of us have spent far too long, right, being pointed to the minds of men instead of the heart of God? Can we walk you through the word, right? Can I raise your expectation and your standard this morning and feed you with the word of God? Can we do that? Yes. Amen. Deuteronomy 11, verse 26. Say there when you're there. The first mention of Gilgal is actually not in the promise. It's in the wilderness. Watch this. Verse 26. See, I am setting before you today blessings and curses. The blessing is if you obey the command of the Lord, your God, and I am giving it to you today. The curse is if you obey the command. Uh, the curse is... The curse, if you disobey the command, sorry, of the Lord your God and turn from the way that I commanded you today by following other gods, which you've not known. When the Lord your God has brought you into the land, you are to enter it and to possess it. The one that you're entering and possessing, you are to proclaim on Mount Gerizim the blessings and on Mount Ebal the curses. As you know, these mountains are across the Jordan. That's in the promise. West of the road, towards the setting of the sun, near the great tree of Morah, in the territory of the Canaanites, living in Arabah, in the vicinity of a place called Gilgal. You are about to cross the Jordan to enter and take possession of the land the Lord your God has given you. When, say when, when, when you have taken it over and are living there, be sure that you obey all the decrees and the law, the laws that I am setting before you. Say the first time that Gilgal is mentioned is mentioned by Moses from God in a wilderness. But I love this because actually David picked up on it when he said, listen, God has set a table for you in the midst of your enemies. You just didn't realize that it was solely in the middle of the promise. When you cross over, he says, and enter what is promised near a place called Mount Gerizim, you know what that means? Fertile. And a, a, another mountain called Ebal, that means barren. You will be in a place in the view of fertile and barren land. In between those two is going to be a place called Gilgal. In the midst of your enemies, I'm going to set this table. I'm going to set it and seat you at it, a place where you will learn to sit Sup and be satisfied. Amen. Man, somebody need that this morning? Yes. As you take possession of what is promised, I'm going to bring you to a place you're going to learn to call home. A place where you learn to be seated. Can I show you that? <coughs> Listen, when God's serious about a thing, he makes an impression on the people. This is actually the ruins of a Gilgal. The one right by Jericho. Doesn't look like much, does it? Yeah, see, the place that he brings you to call home doesn't look like much either until you cultivate it. Let me give you an aerial view of it. Right? What's neat? Look. Look what's happening. Do you see it? I'm going to clue you in on something that we're not going to spend much time on today. Right? But this place is actually a footprint. can't see it, can you? In the center, right, 12 stones from the Jordan were set. 
on the heel of the foot, right? In the center of the foot, near the center of the foot is an altar. And it looks like a round table, doesn't it? Yeah, because every table is an altar and every altar is a table, right? Near Jericho, where the tabernacle in the presence of God was set, he set up a footprint. Yeah. Joshua 1 3, and I will give you every place where you set your foot. Joshua 10 24, from Gilgal, Joshua heard and marched out and came forward to Makeda and commanded the people to a place where they set their foot on their enemy's neck. Proverbs 16 9 might resonate with you for a minute. The heart of a man. Plans his way. But the Lord, well, he establishes his footsteps. I got your attention this morning? I don't want to spend much time here, but I want you to know something. The first time Gilgal is mentioned, God says, I am going to lead you to a place that you're going to learn to call home, like a table laid out for you in the view of your enemies, and it is going to cause you to leave more of an impression on this world than this world is leaving on you. Amen. And if you let it, it will be a lasting footprint on this generation. Yeah. But in order for that to happen, you must cross over from your nomadic way of life into a place where you can learn to settle, take root and call home. You are going to have to take your stand. That is what enables you to know what is being spoken of. Deuteronomy eleven twenty six. 26. He set a table for me in the view of my enemies. He made an impression. I'm going to put my foot on your neck. It's just a matter of time. And guess what? I'm going to use my people to do it. I love it. Jason Upton has a song called Bread and Wine. Anybody ever heard of that? Right? He says, every table has an altar and every breath is a gift from you. Every moment is a treasure. Every day is a kiss from you. We are all children of a journey. Jesus, only you can lead us through. Saints, every time that the word table is mentioned of in the Bible, right, it is mentioned of as the table of his presence found in the tabernacle. And he set, literally set a table in the promise and invited you to it, Deuteronomy. That's amazing, isn't it? Yes. I got so much to cover here, I'm not going to do it today, right? But I want to walk you through this broad scope as we learn to see what God's doing. You know what he's actually doing? He's taking you to a place, right? Where he can cure that internal unrest that you think nobody sees. It's just me? He's bringing you to a place, right? Where he can cure that internal unrest and where that mental, right, duplicity that you're always walking through can be settled. You don't have to live in that sense. Do you want that? Because that's his goal for you. A place where you can finally come to rest in his will for your life and become singular minded and focused about him. This Joshua generation that crossed over from the wilderness to the promise was different than Moses' generation. They were not the same. They did not have a cloud by day and fire by night. Do you understand that? Right? But they had the ark of the testimony that went before them and they had the tabernacle of God that they were not responsible to go to. It's your responsibility. King Jesus laid a table for you. The sovereignty of the Lord leads you to it and your rebellion can say no or your obedience can say yes and he will sit you at it and you will sup with the king of glory. He will feed you from heaven and all of a sudden right, you will become something transformed from what you are now. They didn't have manna. That ceased. But they had the promise to inspire them and the power to carry out what God gave them. 
Is it okay I just walk you through these things? That's who you are. Right? Watch this. Mention number two. Are you with me? Yes. Mention number two. Joshua 4.19. Say that when you're there. I love this one. Joshua 4.19, on the 10th day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and they camped. They camped at a place called Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. You know what that word camp is? Hanah. It means to pitch a tent, to incline, or abide. You ever heard about abiding? You see, the first thing that God did for his people when they crossed over and he brought them into the promise but he said, listen, you're not going to work from strife. You're not going to work from your own strength. You're going to sit down at my table. I'm going to feed you. You're not going to work from condemnation. You're going to work from my victory. You're going to work from sonship, something that is imparted to you, not earned. And from that place, you're going to go out and fight your war, and you're going to come back in. And you're going to be strengthened. The second mention of Gilgal, right, is the place he, that they camped at. A table that they sat at. Joshua 5.24 says this, and I tell you the truth. I'm sorry, John 5.24. And I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. Watch this. He has crossed over from death to life. Mental duplicity. I'm in the wilderness. I'm in the promise. Which one? Only one can be true. The fence belongs to the enemy and they did not stay in the Jordan. They crossed over and then they did something. They camped. They abided in him. For I tell you the truth, the time is coming and now has come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear Shema with the intention of carrying out will live. John 15, 4, abide in me and I will abide in you. Do you see it? He brought them to a place of abiding. A place where they not weren't trying to earn his affection. They were working from his affections. Could you imagine crossing over the Jordan into the promise for the first time, saints? Did you see what it looked like? Didn't look like much, did it? Man, I've been hearing this my whole life. This is the way I'm in the wilderness. And when we get to the promise and I cross over, man, and right, the water split and I walked into it and all of a sudden I'm like, <laughs> one wilderness to the other. You see, we picture, right, that they crossed the Jordan and then they just walked into a fertile ground. It didn't look like the one they just left. But the manna ceased. The cloud by day and the fire by night was gone. And what was in them? I'm standing in the promise, baby. I'm standing in the promise. Do you see it? For the first time, potential and promise meet. Why? Why? What looks so different? What was the difference about this wilderness and that one? Well, that wilderness didn't come with a promise. This one did. And when I'm looking at barren ground, when my family gets here and we look at Denton, we're like, man, this is going to take a pickaxe <laughs> to extract some fruit out of this ground, some hard hearts in this place. Well, thank you, Jesus. Why? Because potential and promise now meets. And this, right, he's going to get glory from when he extracts oaks of righteousness in this place. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Real fixer. <laughs> It's uncultivated. So what does that mean for me? I guess it's my job to cultivate this garden. I guess it's me, Lord. Man, I've been hearing my parents talk about it all the life, but that's a problem. They keep talking about it, right? But they ended in rebellion. You showed up and realized that they actually were helping you and cursing you with low expectations because they kept doing all the work but not delegating to you so that when you came to the promise, you know how to fight. Okay, that's funny you in here. Saints, home is where God makes it. Home is not where the heart is. 
Because your heart is exceedingly wicked all of the days. As sovereignty places you into a ground and you are a seed, he waters it and then you grow. In case you, unless you just make, you're the Lord of your decisions. Kingdom culture is where you cultivate it. Amen? Yeah. yeah. 2 Chronicles 15, 2, the Lord is with you when you're with him. Mm. Acts 17, 26, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all of the face of the earth, having predetermined the allotted periods and boundaries and places in which they should live. That includes you, saints. Right? You'll never have a sense of fulfillment until you reach the place where you belong. And when you find belonging, right? then you should be fully there. I'm digging a little deep this morning. I'm slow walking you through some things, right? It's a different pace for you. Call it a change-up pitch. Right? Because everyone of you needs to belong. And when you find it, you find home. Man, this is a shepherdless land and a nomadic people and everybody's scattered, right? Doing their own thing. And God wants you to have a place called home. A place you will abide in. A place where you can go out and fight and come back and get healed. That's what Gilgal was for the people. Gilgal <coughs> is where you learn to abide. With me this morning? The third time Gilgal is mentioned is Joshua 420. Say there when you're there. Joshua 420 and Joshua set up at Gilgal, 12 stones that they took out of the Jordan. And he said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants ask their fathers, what do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed to the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you crossed over. And the Lord your God did it, did to the Jordan just what he had done to the Red Sea. When he dried it up before us until... We had crossed over. He did this so that all the people of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Saints, has there ever been a time in your Newer Testament that you have heard of stones that testify to who God is and what he's done for us? Yeah, 1 Peter 2, 4. As you come to him, the living stone, Rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, say me. me. Yes, you. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. That's a stone house, not a brick house. <laughs> to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in the scripture it says, See, I have laid a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Saints, Peter is literally one of the 12 stones. And he was not like his generation. You know who else was not like their previous generation? The Joshua generation. The Joshua generation, like Peter, knew that they were a new breed. You're not like the rest, so quit trying to be like that. Yeah. Understand that division is not actually that. It's distinction. Yeah. And God loves distinction. He calls it holiness. They were about other people. They were a communal people. They were a hungry people. They were an inviting people. Because they knew that God had brought them to a table to build a family. Some of the best times are spent sitting around a dinner table, yeah. feasting, amen? Yeah. amen? A supernatural family that are not into telling old stories, but making new stories with each other. Gilgal, saints, is where memories are made. Gilgal is where you learn what Psalm 16 meant when it said, Lord, you have assigned to me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. My boundary lines have fallen in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. And what does the Bible say? The inheritance of God is it's his people. 
Gilgal, saints, is where I learn that his boundaries are my pleasant places. Hmm. Turn with me to Joshua 5.1. Say there when you're there. there. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Joshua 5 won the fourth time. Gilgal was mentioned. Now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along with the coast, along the coast heard about the Lord and how he dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until they had totally crossed over, their hearts melted. And they no longer had the courage to face them. At that time, what time? That time. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again as a nation. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gabeah Haraloth. Now this is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the desert on the way after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the desert, any of you born again in the desert? During the journey from Egypt had not. The Israelites had moved about in the desert 40 years until all the men who were military age, when they left Egypt had died, since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land that he had solemnly promised their fathers to give us. A land flow of milk and honey. Listen, this is not about being saved and not saved. These men died as sons. They just died as sons not meeting their potential. So, verse 7. He raised up their sons in their place. And these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised along the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in camp, in that abiding, until they were healed. Then, verse 9, the Lord said, Joshua, said to Joshua, Today, today I have rolled away the reproach Disappointment and disapproval of Egypt yeah. from you. So that place then was called a jewel gallery. <laughs> Saints, those who abided in Gilgal were pure and they were innocent, but they knew nothing of warfare. They knew nothing of having skin in the game. Because their parents did it all for them. They didn't turn out so well, did they? Not the parents. So God raises up a faithful generation. Chronicle says, right, he's looking for a heart that is what? Fully his. Saints Gilgal is where servants become sons. You know what that means? You can't, you can't effectively lead until you effectually follow. You understand? And that is what the Joshua generation did. They followed their parents out of honor. And when it came time to cross over, their parents chose rebellion, but their sons chose to cross over and cultivate potential into promise. Man, we need not short, fall short or stop short of what God's called you to be. A son. Now that they're in the promised land, when the time had come to cut away the flesh, listen, the sons didn't see it as a duty. That's what servants do. The sons, they knew it was much more than just that. It was much more than just getting rid of what was unnecessary. Are you following me? It was about identification with the promise of God. About identifying with God's goal for my life. Not just my goals, God's goal. And in one painful moment, cutting your ties from the old man. Are y'all with me this morning? Yes. Who was it that circumcised this generation? Was it Moses? Moses didn't circumcise this generation. Joshua circumcised this generation. Moses represents the letter of the law. 
Joshua represents the spirit in which that law was given, not opposed to each other, but handing the baton to the other. Saints, Gilgal is a place where you learn the difference in between these two. One is a servant that brings you to the edge of the promise. The other is the only one that enables you to cross over into the promise. Saints, Gilgal is where the shame of your wilderness years are buried and done. How many of us are carrying shackles into a free land? Gilgal is where the reproach, the disapproval, the disappointment, it's rolled away. Can you remember a time, or maybe the last time someone told you that because flesh was torn, because blood was shed, because a stone was rolled away, that your guilt that your shame, that your disapproval, that your disappointment, that your reproach was buried and done with. Can you remember a time? Yeah. yeah. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Colossians 2.9 says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And you have been given fullness of Jesus Christ. He held nothing back. He does not reserve. He gave you the fullness. He is the head over every power and every authority. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature. So that with a circumcision done by the hands, so not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Messiah himself, by Yeshua, by Joshua. Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God. Where's your faith? In the transformational power of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead, how dead is dead? It's dead. Dead men don't speak. Dead men don't walk. Dead men don't feel. Dead is dead. When you were dead in your sins in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins and he canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. You know what that means? He took away the punishment of the law. He, he paid that price for you. He did your time. He took it and he nailed it away, nailed it to a cross. And watch this. When he did so, he then disarmed the enemy. He disarmed the powers and authorities. He made public spectacle over them, yes. triumphing over them publicly by a cross. Yes. He literally left the gun in the enemy's hand but snatched his ammo. Thank Jesus. Now the devil's running around with a water pistol, intimidating you, lying to you, making you think he has leverage against you, but he doesn't. Right. Saints, Gilgal is the place where you finally wake up and look around at the table that you're sitting at and realizing the seat that you sit in has my name on it. The seat that you've been sitting in, look on, look on the back of it. Inscribed in it is my son. Inscribed on it is my delight. Inscribed, inscribed on it is my handiwork. Inscribed on it is my joy. Gilgal is a place where your sense of disappointment fades. And where the bread placed in front of you feeds you. Gilgal is where you stop accusing what God no longer accuses. Gilgal is a table that you eat from until you are healed from your internal unrest and your mental duplicity. Tell me we don't need that, saints. Come on, at least somebody's bearing witness in this place. Turn with me to Joshua 5, 10. Say there when you're there. Put it on there or something? Joshua 5, 10. On the evening of the 14th day, while camped, guess where? At Gilgal. On the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated. Oh man, we see, we think of people, right, that are ritualistic and rigid. Nah, these people love to party. 
And rightly so. They celebrated the Passover. The day the death angel passed over and they walked out and went, I knew that blood was going to work. <laughs> the day after Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land. Unleavened bread and roasted grain. Watch this. And on that day, the manna stopped. The day after they ate the food from the promise, there was no longer any manna for the Israelites. But that year, they ate what they cultivated from the harvest of the promise. Man, do we need to get there. Saints, the new breed that camped at the king's table are not anti-tradition. Are you with me this morning? Yes. They're not anti-tradition, anti they're anti-religion. Because they found the real thing. Yeah. A fatherly relationship with God that puts them at ease as they sit and suck in their full surrender with yes, the king. Lord, yes. Saints, those who find satisfaction with the daily indwelling of the spirit are not asking God for things to fall from heaven. Why? Because they understand that he's with them. Yes. Gilgal is a, Gilgal is a place that is full of people that don't think of a morbid funeral when they think of the blood of the lamb. Gilgal is full of spirit-filled people. Is that you, saints? Yes. It's, it's full of spirit-filled people, a new breed that understand that the blood that was shed for them on the cross was our king's finest hour. Yes. And if we get to come to a place where we get to crucify the flesh, it's our finest hour, too. Yes. We know sons don't shrink back at risk, right? Nor do they take for granted the life that's been given to them. Sons of Gilgal celebrate life and laugh at difficulties. Amen. That's what Gilgal is full of. Gilgal is where we stop manifesting faithlessness by praying for God to drop manna from heaven and begin to practice faithfulness by cultivating heaven right here in our camp. Right. Yeah. And until it affects the whole promise. Saints, listen to me. Gilgal is where you learn to cultivate the power of the blood. Hey, that set you free. Amen. Amen. Joshua 9 1. Say that when you're there. Joshua 9 1. Now, when all the kings west of the Jordan heard about these things and what God was doing in his people camped in Gilgal, those in the hill country, in the western foothills, and along the entire coast of the great sea, as far as Lebanon, they came together to make war against Joshua and Israel. You know why? Because that, when you're at rest, that's what the enemy wants to do. He's not happy. However, when the people of Gibeon heard that Joshua had come to Jericho, and to Ai, they resorted to tricking them, a ruse. They went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn out sacks and old wineskins, cracked and mended. The men who wore the patched sandals on their feet and wore old clothes, these were these people. All the bread of their food supply was dry and it was moldy. Then they went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal and said to him, and the men of Israel, we have come from a distant country to make a covenant or a treaty with you. The men of Israel said to the Hivites, but perhaps you live near us. How then can we make a treaty or covenant with you? No, 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 no. We are your servants, they said to Joshua. But Joshua asked them, who are you and where you come from? They answered, your servants had come from a distant country because of the fame of the Lord. You see, the people were making an impact on the land. They were their enemy. And so they wanted to trick them into a covenant so that when they came to their city, it wouldn't be annihilated. So it was a lie. The people came and lied to them and tricked the people of God into a covenant. You ever feel like you got into a covenant? You didn't know what was, you signed up for? And those are the ones you chose. Joshua 9, 16. Three days after they made a treaty with the Gibeonites, the Israelites heard that they were their neighbors living near them. So the Israelites set out on the third day and they came to these cities, Gibeon, 
Kera, hmm, Beroth, and Kiriath Jarim. But the Israelites did not attack them. Why? Because the leaders of the assembly had sworn an oath to them by the Lord and to the God of Israel. The whole assembly grumbled against the leaders. But all the leaders answered, we have given our promise. We have given our oath. We are in covenant, the God of Israel, and we cannot touch them now. Saints, what's happening here? What's happening in Gilgal? What type of people are this? When you are invited to the king's table, you are invited to participate in kingdom culture. Not your own chosen culture. In the kingdom, there is a culture of honor. Oh boy, do we need this. A culture of integrity. Because you represent royalty. You understand that? You're no longer a pauper. Now you are a prince in the kingdom, right? When representing God, you are a son. And he's your father. One who is like his father. One who is like the king that you're sitting at the table with. Yeah. I received that. So ask yourself, are you going to be like the previous generation or are you going to be like this Joshua generation? Will you be like your fathers with fickle faith and partial promises? Or will you be like God? God. Saints, ten times out of ten. Ten times out of ten, you do not fully know what you sign up for when you sign up with a covenant promise. Yes. Whether it's your friendships, whether it's your jobs, whether it's your church, or whether it's your marriages, ten times out of ten, you do not fully know what you signed up for. Why? Because these relationships aren't built on facts. They are built on trust. Yes. Gilgal is where you learn to keep your covenants even when it hurts. Remember, you're a cripple invited to the king's table. Your upfront invitation into covenant love is teaching you how to love. That pain that you feel when it hurts, it's the weight of your cross. It's the weight of your covenant. It's supposed to hurt because you know it's real. Ooh. Turn with me to Joshua 10 as we look at the seven. There. Usually when you're eating a seven quarts meal, the seventh is a dessert. <laughs> you're all full, lethargic, <laughs> and almost there. <laughs> Joshua 10 6 the Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp called Gilgal do not abandon your servants come up to us quickly and save us help us because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us I mean at that moment you could say Listen, maybe because you tricked me or I didn't really fully know what I was getting when I signed up. That's not what they said. You guys not full of the people like that because they've been invited to a table, right? And they understand fully, hey, that the covenant that God extended to us, well, that was a covenant of mercy, right? But it was also a covenant where we transformed me into being like him. We getting something this morning? Yeah. Y'all okay with a steak instead of just milk? Yes. Where have Joshua's generation heard this cry before? Maybe the last eight weeks you heard in Deuteronomy 9-7 when Moses says, Do not forget, but remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What Moses' generation heard was now being echoed to the Joshua generation. Do you see it? Remember. Remember your covenant, God. And now, strangers and newly equated covenants are coming to them and say, Hey, remember your covenant with me. Why would they do, why would they honor something like that? Because they remember their covenant with their God. Hallelujah. They remember the day that they were invited to the king's table. And they, somebody had to carry them there because they were crippled. Don't forget your servants. 
Saints, the same cry that went out to God on behalf of Joshua's generation is the same cry that went out to their parents in the wilderness. But how are you going to answer? This is where every battle that you fight in the wilderness before crossing over, it's an internal battle for yourself. Do you realize that? Yes. But listen, there's a crossover. Something's fundamentally changed. Now, every battle fought after the crossing, when you are securely seated at home in your identity as a son of God, is fought to include others. And also to leave a lasting impression or a footprint on their lives. Saints Gilgal is where you go from being selfless and selfish, I'm sorry, to selfless. Gilgal is populated with a new breed. So why are we taking our borders from everything we see around us? Right. Instead of the king that we sit at the table with. Yeah. We are sons of what? Promise. That's who you are. You might as well get used to it. I that means when you see potential and it's not made promise, it frustrates your inner man. Yes. Because you are called to fulfill that promise and become fully his. The Joshua generation only knew how to look forward. They knew nothing about looking back. At Gilgal, you learn to fight for your brother's rest, even when they don't fight for yours. Man, that might keep somebody rooted in a church where they don't really like everybody. Because I'm not here for you anyway. I'm here for God. And he's calling me to fight for you and restore integrity when you don't have much. Saints, you have been seated at a table and given interior rest. Man, I hope that's true for every one of you. You've been seated at a table and given interior rest and mental stability that others will feed on. This is where you go out to fight in order to bring others back to the table you sit at. Hey, come, the feast is good. Man, you gotta meet the king. Oh, man. Oh, by the way, he's my father. Man, you are loving it. Yes. Amen. Amen. Saints, when you're found home, it's a place you want to invite others to, am I right? Yeah. yeah. Verse 6. Do not abandon your servants. Did they have some issues? What were their issues? Abandonment issues. St. Gilgal is a table where those who have been abandoned find rest. Gilgal is the home of the orphaned. It is the home of the crippled. It is the home of the widowed. It's where these people find rest. Gilgal is a table that has been spread in the promise where whosoever will shall come. Man, I know that's your story. Who else belongs at the table? Gilgal is a prototype of something called a city of refuge that you'll see laid out in the promise where you could run when you were guilty and plead the blood. Proverbs 18.10, in the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. When you feel safe, you're at rest inside, aren't you? Yeah. Man, we need that. Gilgal is where the righteous abide and receive healing as they continue to possess what is promised. Is that you, saints? Yes. Yeah. Praise God. Gilgal is a table set in the midst of my enemies. Gilgal is the promise where I learn to run and to abide in. Gilgal is a state of mind that I find pleasant. Gilgal is the truth that gives my soul rest and my conscience stability. Gilgal, saints, is where the flesh of the old identity is cut away. Gilgal is where the stone of your disappointment and disapproval was rolled away. Gilgal is where the sons of promise called home. Saints, if you are uh, in unrest and nomadic, you don't have a place you call home. And I'm talking about a spiritual home, a body called home. 
If God designed the church body to be in every single home, then we believe that we forsake the assembly of God. There's a reason he calls you to the assembly because you need to be sharpened and you need to be at rest and you need to learn to be rooted and you can't do it alone. Amen. Gilgal is where the sons returned after every single battle and received healing. Gilgal, saints, was a foreshadow of the cross. Gilgal is where I am at rest with the crucified life. Why? Because I am securely seated at his table Amen. called promise. Yes. Mm. Psalm 23. As we close out today. I just broadly walked you through. A lot, right? Yeah. Because we need to learn to be people, right? That can go to high places. And take an aerial view of what God's doing. You see, prophetic is pattern. And pattern can only be seen when you rise above the fog of war and understand what he's doing broadly. And I believe that about you. You're prophetic people. A people that are going to rise up and understand the warfare. Not blink at it, but laugh at it. Because you're securely seated at the table. Understanding that the king has his hand on this. He calls you a son and he's the one that you send out and you come back to be fed by him. Yeah. <laughs> a place called home where you receive internal rest and mental security. Psalm 23, 1. Adonai is my shepherd. I like no good thing. He has me lie down in green or grassy pasture. He leads me by quiet water. Do you think he's actually just talking literally? No, he's talking about your soul. He restores my inner person. He guides me in right paths for his name's sake. Even when I pass through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no disaster for you are with me. It's not a lonely journey, saints. I fear no disaster for you're with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. You prepare the table for me. And hey, it's even as my enemies watch. You anoint my head with oil from an overflowing cup. Goodness and grace will pursue me. Will you reciprocate it? Every day of my life. And I will live in the house of Adonai. For years and years to come. Because I know what it is to camp at Gilgal. More than, it's not a city. It's a state of mind. It's a place where you come to in your walk. Immediately as you cross into the Jordan. You know why? Romans 8 said, therefore there is now no condemnation in Christ. You can't work for victory. You have to work from it. And that place comes when you are seated. Solely. First and foremost. At his table in your sonship. It's not a far off God with a black robe and a gavel ready to spank you. Amen. He's your father. He's putting up with you, yes, but also your number one fan. Yeah. Able to transform you and looking forward to the day that you are just like him. Yeah. Yes. At rest, whole. You can't be whole unless you are home. You understand that? Stand with me. Father, we thank you for sending your son, Yeshua, Joshua, to bring us through to the promise for crossing over into sonship. No longer just a servant, but a son. No longer a slave to sin, mighty God, but captivated by righteousness. Father, we thank you for the invitation to your table. For, Father, we were crippled, and you brought us and to the table that we might sit up with you, Lord God, until our soul learns to surrender to you fully in trust. In a place of rest, a place of strength, and a place of power. Father, we sit securely seated at your table today 
eating like sons, going forth possessing the promise because you feed us, nurture us, empower us, and set us free. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this place today that you would release them into freedom. Mighty God, that you would fill them with your mighty word, that you would activate it by the power of your spirit, and that we would learn to love each other as we go forth, Lord, to take the land and come back to the table to sit down with each other. Father, we love you, and we pray these things in your holy name. And everybody said? Amen.